we are so good at specializing our way right into a little hole. So, you know, I'm one of the best academic advisors in the world. I don't know what they're doing over there in the living learning environment, but right here, we got it going on. Right. And so I think one of our obstacles has been not, not that we don't know what we're doing, but how do we learn to do it together? Right. Yeah. See that it's, really, it's so interesting what you're saying, because I think oftentimes, so we talk about if I'm a great advisor, what students experiences, Rachel's a great advisor, but my institution is failing me. Yeah. Right. Versus if we are a team and we're surrounding our students, then it's not about Jaretta's awesome or Rachel's awesome. It's about the institution has a culture that is around supporting students to, through towards success. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining me um, for episode 47 of Cap and Gown. I'm Rachel Phillips Buck, VP for Student Success at Ferris Resources. Oh, look at all my friends joining us. Hello, everybody. I so appreciate your time, especially in the middle of this super busy season. I was just on a campus last week, and I know you guys are working really hard. So thank you for joining me live. Also, for those of you who find um, our podcast, wherever you find your podcast, appreciate you spending time with us um, as you're doing other things. So thank you. It's always such an honor to see um, all of our community that joins us. You guys, this is such a good one. I'm so excited. I've been excited about this one um, since it was scheduled a couple of months ago um, because our guest today is just one of the most amazing people that I know. And I am so excited. I know so many of you know um, our guest. And so (laughs) she's a big draw today. And I'm super excited for those of you who don't know our guest to introduce you to her and all of her expertise. So we're going to do State of the Union first, and then I'm going to invite her on um, so that we can spend this time together talking about how we can build highly effective student success teams. So that's our topic for today. Let's dive into State of the Union because there's a lot going on. I don't have really robust reports for you today. I just have a couple of like, just so you know, this thing is happening. Um, So you guys know who are in charge of Title IX, that Title IX, the rewrites to the previous administration's Title IX, which came out in August of 2020. Rewrites were supposed to come up in April. Now they're not coming out until May, which is kind of a bit gigantic bummer because you all have to still make these changes and now you have a shorter amount of time to do that. So um, if you are in charge of Title IX, I'm really sorry that's happening to, to you. If you are not in charge of Title IX, find the person on your campus who's in charge of Title IX and say, hey, I'm really sorry they pushed that deadline back. I know it's going to be a lot of stress for you. So that's in the news. Also, I don't know if you saw this uh, report coming out of um, Higher Ed Dive, which is about FAFSA's completions. They're about, or they're down about 9% from last year. So a couple of really interesting things about this. First of all, fewer people completed the FAFSA um, at the end of March that had done so at the same point last year. So that is a decrease of 873,000 students. So that's the first data point for you to know. The second one is that that decline is actually driven by FAFSA um, renewals. So new FAFSA filers rose, But completions among students who are already enrolled in college fell by 12%. So that's 880,000, making up the majority of that decline that we saw. And then um, renewals among enrolled students eligible for federal Pell Grants, which oftentimes, remember, is a proxy for low-income students, dropped more than 15%. So that's down almost half a million uh, applications. So it's really interesting, you guys, we're seeing because of the hotter economy, because we have students who have stopped out for a little while or finished their high school in kind of a strange situation, FAFSAs are down. Um, We'll keep our eye on that, but one thing I would be encouraging you is to be looking at that completion rate for your enrolled students as an indication of a high at-risk student. So if you have a student who was a first-year student or a sophomore student, they have not recompleted that form, 
we can make some inferences about uh, whether or not they're planning to come back. And it might just be a good conversation. If you have that list of students, if you're using our software, I would upload it into a care area. And then I would just go in and have some of those discussions, especially, which I know you guys are all doing right now because we are in the season of working, you're not enrolled and under-enrolled students. So that is a piece of data just to be um, keeping your eye out for. Also a really great article I would encourage you to go read in the Press Herald about um, a shortage of housing for, for our college students. There's like a perfect storm where for so many of our schools, we don't have enough on house or on campus housing for students. And there's a huge desire for that because students have had to do online learning from home and all of those things. So they're very eager to be part of the community. But also um, you're seeing rent increase across the board. Um, but if you look specifically in some of the popular college towns, for example, Chapel Hill, North Carolina saw a 24% jump in rent. Uh, Tempe, Arizona saw a 31% uh, jump in rent. So there's this press on all sides. We don't have enough housing for our students to be on campus in some cases, but then they also can't afford to stay off campus. University of Tampa did something really interesting. They had so little housing for their students that they actually offered their incoming freshmen a tuition break if they would defer their acceptance to the next year. So they're like, we want you to come to campus, but we don't have any place for you to be. So we'll give you some money back if you will just wait until next year. So I'm really curious for you guys, if you're experiencing this housing crush, how you've experienced um, an increase in students wanting to be on campus or even just in the, the area that you're in, if you've seen, seen that increase in rent that is a hardship for students. I'll tell you in this article, so there's a lot of details here, but um, one of the things that I thought was amazing is Long Beach City College, here's their program to try to solve this problem. They launched a pilot program that provided 15 homeless students space in the parking garage so they could sleep in their cars and still have access to bathrooms and electrical outlets. That was their solution to our students don't have a place to live, giving them a parking space in their garage. So it doesn't seem like a great solution to me. I feel like we could do better if we, if we thought about that a little more. Okay, two more things for you. One is this article coming out of University Business from Measures Learning uh, Proctor U platform. This is a platform that goes in and looks at, uh, does proctoring of online tests. Um, breaches of protocol for online test uh, exams soared to 6.6% in 2021. That doesn't seem huge until I tell you that it is 13 times the cheating that was recorded uh, the year before the pandemic, when the rate was only 0.5%. So a breach basically means this student had access to um, unapproved uh, resources while they were taking the exam, like they were looking at their cell phone, those kinds of things, um, access a breach. So that's interesting. This company is like, hey, we need to be really careful because you have to make sure that you're certifying the integrity of your uh, exams, which is absolutely true. But you guys know I love language. And so here's what I think is so fascinating. Um, the recommendation is you need to make clear to students when they are allowed to use additional materials to find answers. Most students, when they cheat, have some kind of rationalization. A much smaller percentage of people cheat on exams right after reading something that says, we expect you to do your own work and not cheat. And so I just love the brain because when you tell people that they're like, oh, right, there is no rationalization. I should do my own work and not cheat. There's a very simple <laughs> way to have an impact on students cheating. Um, but I think it's going to be an issue that our schools have to look at, especially as we're doing online exams. And then the last one, um, you guys will chat this to you. Uh, this comes out of a lot of different resources that are looking at the impact the pandemic has had on our college students and mental health. You guys know, I was on a campus last week and I asked a room full of 12 people, what is the biggest challenge to student success? And almost to a person, it was, anxiety, depression, feeling overwhelmed, not knowing how to live in community. We just have a lot of mental health um, things that are bubbling to the surface. I know you guys are looking at this. I was talking to another client yesterday and she was like, I don't think we have an idea about the lasting impact this is gonna have. So 
Um, lots of information about how we're seeing that come out. We have students who have feelings of isolation, academic difficulty, 76% um, of students polled in this uh, group of 5,000 students reported emotional stress is making it difficult for them to be successful in college or to think about continuing college. And then there's a really powerful um, study that comes out of eScholarship.org that says they did a survey of 30,000 undergraduate students and 15,000 graduate students at nine public research universities. Um, there was, so 35% of undergraduates screened for major depressive disorder were um, diagnosed with that. 39% of undergraduate and graduate students screened for generalized anxiety disorder. So we're just seeing a huge increase um, in both of those things. They are, let's see, uh, major depressive disorder two times more likely than in 2020, and generalized anxiety disorder 1.5 times more like uh, more likely than in in 2020. So, this article is really great because it breaks it down by demographics, by socioeconomic level, by majors. It's a great one to dive into. There's a lot of really helpful information there. But I know that I am preaching to the choir when I tell you that our students are really struggling. Um, and I think it's really prevalent this time of the year uh, when we're thinking about test anxiety. That is a really difficult uh, place that students are finding themselves now. So that is the State of the Union, which means that I get to move on now to an introduction of my guest, um, Dr. Jaretta Nelson. So excited for her to join us. So you guys remember that we've been talking about culture code. Hey, friends. Hey, friend. It's so good to see you. I'm so happy because, so let me just, let me get, for those, for those of you who don't know Jaretta, I was looking at her bio um, and I love, here's my favorite pieces. Jaretta has an uncanny ability to relate to and communicate to others, ensuring that every client and colleague feel heard and supported. That is so true about you. You have this long history in higher education. You created Moving the Needle, which we're gonna talk more about. You work with presidents and boards and student success and all of these different elements. But I love your vision for student success and how we are going to change the impact of students. So Dr. Nelson, thank you for joining me. That is such a pleasure. To <laughs> task the audience with understanding a deep uh, respect for each other and deep partnership that we've had. It's just a pleasure to be with you and okay. fun to learn something in those first 10 minutes. Every time I listen, I always do. Oh my goodness. Well, I would like to say the, the most important, the two most important things about you are, first of all, that you and I love very sweet coffee. Don't judge us. You don't know us. And second of all, we have a very strong affinity for sticky notes and how they can change interactions. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Absolutely true. And how much work you can get done when you've got some. That's yes, awesome. exactly. Yeah. So I want to start off with, first of all, just reminding all of our listeners, we're in the middle of the culture code, super helpful book. I have been saying, I love this book. It's changing my mind. It's changing my practices. We started with belonging cues and how we change our students from at risk brain to connection brain, which is super important. Um, we talk then about sharing vulnerabilities, how we offer up a vulnerability and accept vulnerabilities from others. Mm. And we now are within that vulnerability umbrella, thinking about how we create cooperative teams. And so the reason I wanted you to come on today is because you created Moving the Needle in 2011. It has just grown and grown and grown. And I know at the heart of that is really successful module teamwork. So can you introduce us to Moving the Needle before we dive into successful teams? Absolutely. Um, I would be honored to. And I can't wait to read the book. I mean, I think I did the, the short version of it just to make sure I had some of that shared language with you today. But um, I'm, I'm so moved by continual work on campuses to try to do better with each other. You know, we talk so much about our students and how important it is to build a sense of belonging for them and a sense of community. Um, 
at Credo, we have a, a deep vision for impacting a million students and their families uh, by 2030 and 100,000 leaders who stand in service to them. So when we think about that leadership group who are serving those students, I know they need a psychological sense of belonging themselves, a yes. sense of community. And you were just talking about mental health and every president and cabinet and, and middle talent, registrars, financial aid, directors of academic advising, they're telling me about their own mental health, right? And their capacity as well in this moment. So I'm so glad you're doing that in a way that kind of applies both to students and to, to uh, teams of people. But yeah, I, um, you know, I, I met you all when you were launching the work that you are now uh, so invested in. And it was around how do we get the culture to think about this? So the question on the table has never been what do we need to learn about student success? We all have Pascarella and Terenzini on our desks. It's giant, you know, it holds a cup of coffee on top of it now. <laughs> and, and we continue to say every time a research gets proven, it's, yep, we know. It, it's, it's deep engagement, it's being known, it's being adapted and included and seen and scaffolded to. I don't even know if that's the right language, right? So we, we know what to do, we even know what some of the exercises are, the engagements are, the learning appropriate learning uh, engagements are. We just can't seem to get it done. Yeah. So when I started the project, we had been hired by someone to help with student success on their campus. And we did the best work right from the textbook, the best research. And we did, you know what? The needle didn't move. And when I asked why, when I went back to campus, it was because that middle talent, the folks who are really doing the work said, I, I got told to do this and I've already got my load of things I need to do. And by the way, what I was told to do does not really align with what I do on a daily basis anyway. And I'm not sure exactly why we're doing this. And I said, <laughs> what the benefit is to be on this. And by the way, we tried this once before and it never worked then. And on and on the things that I think everybody on your uh, listening team uh, today would say, yeah, I hear that same thing on the campus. So. I went back to the drawing board. I, I pulled some really smart cultural um, sort of anthropologists folks around and said, what would it look like if an entire group of people who were navigating so many areas of a student's experience actually thought about the individual student? And I keep going, Rachel, back to my own experience in healthcare where I would go see a certain doctor or a specialist for something and I would go someplace else for something else. And I felt like these people do not know what the other person is saying. And what happened to me the first time when I was caring for someone in my family and there was a team of healthcare individuals, specialists, like powerhouse people. And they came to my dad's bedside with me and they were all in the room. And when we solved the problem at hand, it got solved in a whole way, a whole person way for yes. his physical health, for his sense of hope and his vision. They were respectful of each other. They were uh, sharing about what needed to happen. And it really was a moment for me where I thought, so what if we were able to do that on a campus? And oh, I went back to the drawing board and found out there's actually some good theory about thinking about what help students stay, not what's wrong with them, but what happens with them so that they'll stay and brought some folks together and we designed this project. And we learned from the very beginning that it would only really be accurately or well delivered if we could figure out how to do it through teams of people on the campus. And thus was created the project and various teams over these last many, many years of people who've been breaking down those silos, right? And really working together. So it's been, it's been fun. Well, I, that was so eloquently put. I feel like every time we talk Jorda, I like write down Jorda quotes. <laughs> so I love that we can't seem to be able to get it done, which I think is such a genuine reflection of how practitioners feel. It's not that we're confused. We would love to identify our students, connect with them, solve their problems, measure the outcomes. It's that if there is no one holding space for us to do that, how, how can we manage it, right? And so 
I love that idea that we have to have. And one of the interesting things about moving the needle is that it's a long-term engagement on a campus. So it's not like we just dip in and we're like, oh yeah, it's kind of a wreck. You guys should fix that and dip out. But it's actually that you guys are going and saying, we are going to spend time with you shaping your processes and policies and helping you with the student success outcome, which I really love. And I know you guys are finalizing your 2022 class, but I was just thinking about your pipeline of schools that are so interested in what you're doing because it's a different way to change student success. Mm -hmm. And it's so innovative. It's like um, really obvious but why don't, why don't we do it? You know what I mean? Like, yes, we should all be on the same page and we should all work together to change this thing. And yet it is a really innovative approach that you don't see on campuses very often. So yeah, I love it. Some of the obstacles to that, why don't we do it are, are some of the things I think we all face when we're in this, this work of student success. The folks who decide budgets or decide strategy or priorities, um, including the board, right? You had mentioned earlier, I do a lot of work with presidents, a lot of work with boards, will say to me when I go to talk with them, isn't that what they get paid to do already, the student success thing? So I mean, uh, isn't that what they're supposed to be doing? So that that's one piece of sort of the expectation that what we do every day actually is able to influence the student experience. And the second piece is, I think that's just such resistance to this is I, you know, I really don't know what they're doing over there on that side, but right here in my area, I've got it down perfectly. Yes. And it's this assumption that the student's experience is horizontally built when it's actually built in a linear way. Yeah, that's and right. Everything we do, we, we are so good at specializing our way right into a little hole. Yeah. So, you know, I'm one of the best academic advisors in the world. I don't know what they're doing over there in the living learning environment, but right here, we got it going on, right? And so I think one of our obstacles has been not, not that we don't know what we're doing, but how do we learn to do it together, right? Yeah. See that and it's, it's so interesting what you're saying, because I think oftentimes, so we talk about if I'm a great advisor, what students experiences, Rachel's a great advisor, but my institution is failing me, Yeah. right? Versus if we are a team and we're surrounding our students, then it's not about Jaretta's awesome or Rachel's awesome. It's about the institution has a culture that is around supporting students to, through towards success, right? So it is so important to have that holistic all campus buy-in when we're talking about changing culture. Um, so I want to think about for your modules and moving the needle, which is basically where you're like, Hey, we're going to focus on these individual things and we're going to have different teams around each of those things. Yeah. And so those teams are really about kind of focusing on a specific problem, presenting a solution, implement, implementing that solution, and then, and then getting at the measurement. Like, did we do the right thing? Mm -hmm. Have we been successful? which is at the heart of what I want our conversation to be today. How do we look at a team and, and frame it in a helpful way, make sure that we have similar goals, make sure that we are speaking the same language, right? All of those elements. So I wanna take a quick side note, Jaretta. You are, Matt said it before we started and it's really true. I've seen you in a group where you are such a conductor of teams, where you, um, make sure that people are saying what they need to say. You're very in tune with how it's going with everyone. You also are very good at being like, okay, hold on one second. Let's address that. How's that going? Right. Those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Do you find, because I, I think for you that that is kind of an innate way of you being with a group of people that you, that that comes very naturally. Do you find that hard to teach to people? Do you, do you model that for them? Or is it difficult to say, I'm going to teach you how to, conduct a, a team like I would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I, I do think there's some parts of it. What, what did someone say to me? The things that sort of come naturally to you can sometimes be more difficult to teach. But in the case of good facilitation and listening, I, I, I swear it's not that hard, right? <laughs> one, of the things, one of the things we talk about a lot with our moving the needle module teams is, you know, we got to start first with making sure everybody in the room understands why we're doing what we're doing. I, I can't stress how important that is. So it, as the facilitator, it just making really clear, hey, y'all, this is how this benefits students. 
I just want to be clear, I'm not bringing you together to do work that does not have a direct impact on students. So let's have a statement right from the very beginning. If we are successful at this work, this is going to help our students. Mm. And that seems, I bring us back to that. Sometimes when people get off track in a room and, and the meeting's not going well, I'll say, so tell me again, how does that connect back to what we're trying to do for our students? And instead of that being a criticism about someone's answer or response, it just pulls us to the center, something that we all care about. And I gotta tell you, Rachel, as many tired people as there are, as many curmudgeons as there might be on everybody's campus, by the way, every campus has a set of folks who just make it sometimes more difficult. I haven't been yet to a campus where there aren't hearts that are all deeply dedicated to students. They've lost their way in how to execute against that. But, but when drawn toward that, that pulls folks together in a really powerful way. So I think you can teach making the why really clear. The second thing I think that's really important about facilitation is what questions should we be asking about this problem? Ooh, that's good. And opening that up, right? What, and, and asking everyone to offer something. What, what questions do you think that we should be offering? What do you think our group should ask? Who else should we ask about this as well? So creating some curiosity on our part is one of the most inclusive ways to bring people into a, a place of trust, I think, and, and feeling like I've got some shared responsibility in solving this problem. And yeah, so it gets at the heart of, I was going to ask you about, do you, when you're working with groups, are you delivering the goal are you delivering the vision or are you crowdsourcing that within your group? And it sounds like you're saying like, no, we absolutely, if we want buy-in, then we are saying to everybody on that team, what should we be asking? Who else should be included? And what are we trying to accomplish? Is that, yeah. that's a fair reflection of that? I'd say it's a combo, isn't it? Because um, I, I am going to tease a little bit when I say that if given to normal committee sort of function on a campus, it would take a year to, do, to define <laughs> what the problem is. And right. That's a big part of our issue. So I got to say what we come in is with the facts. And I, I was going to talk about that a little bit as well. One of the ways I think to help facilitate is here's what we found when we look at the data. Yes. How would you name what we found? Right. Just go ahead and name it. Show the data. Talk amongst yourselves about the data. It, and equipping people seems to to help them get on the same page really quickly. So once we identify, here's what this points to. Right? We've got a breakdown from the time they finish in July with an orientation until the sixth week of classes. Well, you don't know what the problem is, but boy, you can see there's a breakdown right there. And so now let's start to ask some questions. Let, let's design some questions around it. So a bit of both, I would say, Rachel. Well, I love that because you know my background is counseling. And so I am always saying with practitioners, if you can just show the student that they're not doing well, so we cut out all of the, how you doing? I'm doing fine. Are you sure you're doing okay? Yes, I am. Well, what does that look like? Like all of that stuff. We don't, I don't, we don't have to argue about it. Mm -hmm. I can see that you haven't logged in in the last two weeks. That by definition is not doing well in that class, right? Mm -hmm. I've gotten a referral on you in this class. Your, your faculty are very concerned about you. So now let's move to then how we make sense of the problem and how we create a solution. And so that. Um, everybody is an expert without reason. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like everybody knows exactly. well, your data. Well, everybody knows it. Okay. No, we're going to cut out that everybody knows. And we're going to actually talk about what are the facts and how can we name the problem and then move towards a solution, I think is yeah. a way to, to laser focus. Yeah. Your and, and I think to bring the team together. So, you know, the illustration, I, I mentioned this to you last time we were together. I still go back to that Apollo 13 clip, you know, from the movie yeah. where we, we know they were up in the capsule and there was an issue around oxygen or, or CO2. And so the, the, the leader of the area um, who was sort of trying to problem solve said, brought in all the experts who had anything to do with that and said, we've got a square peg to a round hole. How are we gonna do that? This is the problem. And we have an hour to solve it. Now let's bring all of our data to bed, together to, to, that really bears here to try to solve that problem. When given that kind of fuel, so to speak, I find that faculty and staff become my greatest advocates on the campus. 
So when I give them that data, when I say, no, not all students are registered, or are cleared before the first day of classes, or no, not all students see the advising experience in the same way. Here's what they said. <laughs> when I give them the data, they go back into their worlds and sort of diffuse some of that incorrect yeah. kind of understanding. And so I, I believe data brings a team together, right? Well, there's nothing like being a well-educated um, yeah resource on a topic. I mean, being able to say, this is true. This is not true. This is what we need to do. That's actually not a problem. Mm -hmm. I think it, um, the resource of being able to know what is true and where we need to put our, uh, energy and our effort and what we need to fix, because part of the problem is people are tired spinning their wheels. Yeah. They, they don't want to try to solve a problem and then come to find out, nope, that's not the thing, right? So if we can put them on the right path, I think we gain a lot of credibility with them um, when we do that. Yeah. So, so do you have ground rules for your team? Like when you're doing a team meeting, do you lay out ground rules? Do you just model, here's how we're going to be, here's how we're going to, we're going to make this kind of a safe team, or do you just see how it goes and then address issues as they come up. What do you do about that? So personally on teams on which I am a partner or on leading a team, um, we quickly have established some of our own kinds of, here's what it means to be on a high performing team. Um, and here's what I want, right? Yeah. And here's the kind of feedback I need and I'm looking for. Um, yeah. And we use, as do many teams that sort of are there some instruments that we could use to help name some things? I, I, I find some instruments are better than others. Everyone always offers different kinds of instruments. Yeah. I just think what those are so, such great tools to give me some language so I can give you some feedback, Rachel, or I can say, Rachel, you know this about me, help me right in this regard. But I said, I think setting the ground rules is really important. And, and I can't strongly stress enough that on, on our, <laughs> currently as a small business owner, you would understand this, when you think like an owner versus thinking like an employee, you really think differently. Yeah. And that's one of the things I've transferred into module work and to MTN work is trying to elevate the folks who are working with students to begin to think like you, you are an, an owner of this college or university. You, you yes. have to have that level. You're not just in your own wheelhouse as an employee, right? I'll just do my job. But part of what I want to be a part of in a team is you, is you help me think about the big picture, right? Let's do that together. And I, I, that is a ground rule, right? That is so good, Jordan, because I'm always saying there's this piece of the luxury of I just get to do what I'm doing. It's such a luxury. Like you don't have to think about all the other moving pieces and how they fit together and how they're going to. And yet it is a problem. Because if exactly as you said, I'm an advisor and all I get to do, all I have to do is think about, did I deliver good service to the student? It's a luxury, but it is not connecting to a culture of success. It's not helping students. It's not yeah. helping students, right? Yeah. And I, I, I'll say, I think it takes courage right here. Maybe that's a part of what you've talked about um, and would talk about in teams as well. I, I, this piece of being able to speak courageously, but appropriately, that's another piece I, I like to model, right? Um, I worked with some Quaker institutions, Rachel, I was of them. I've learned so much from them. And I remember my first exposure to a, a meeting that's all consensus that, you know, is very interesting. Wow. I loved the phrase at the end, are all hearts clear? Ooh. And I kept that at the back of my mind as a facilitator in a difficult time or in the midst of my own team meetings thinking, I can tell not all hearts are clear in here. <laughs> yeah. How am I going to get that? How am I going to help make sure? And sometimes I got to go behind one-to-one -one because there's some, you know, uh, that's a better si situation for that person to be clear. But I know I've been successful in team development when I feel like we leave it on the table together yeah, appropriately, right? That all hearts are clear. Yeah, Jordan, you have something about, what is it like, speak loudly your objection and then agree? Yep. Yep. Something like that, which I just love, which is, and, and it gets at, I think, a next um, big rock when we're thinking about teams, which is this vulnerability, this trusting vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And this is from, you know, the five dysfunctions of a team, this idea that we have, it, it's not, our trust is not about like confidence and consistency or assurance in quality. 
we're talking in a team about how we believe that your intentions are good and my intentions are good. And there's no reason that we have to be protective or careful in this group because our vulnerabilities are not going to be used against us because we are trying to accomplish that big picture idea that we've all agreed on and we've all bought into. And that when I say, I cannot disagree with you more, (laughs) that that is not a criticism of you. And it is not, it, it is not anything other than, Hey, I want the best for this team. And if I do not say this thing and we make a decision, my heart is not going to be clear in it. And And I assume I've been added to this team because I represent a certain perspective that the team is stronger when I show up with the things that are important to me, the kinds of questions I would ask, the things that I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if I stay quiet and then grumble later, that is the worst kind of team. (laughs) What we want is for somebody to say, I disagree. I don't like it. Here's why. Let's have that conversation. And then once we've worked through that, then we're all on board. We've decided this is what we're going to do. I totally agree with you. I think there's a, there might be some uh, emerging sort of mm, uh, team safe ways to do that. Uh, and one of them I wonder is, can we ask really good questions like, so what's going to happen when the student actually does X? Mm. Because what I've seen from my seat is this is really their reality. Yeah. So that allows me to bring up the either elephant in the room or so it's a little less on I, I think you're wrong and I've got to restate it. It is more. Can I bring you back to and I'm thinking, Rachel, right now about um, about, about standing at my at my dad's bedside. When I think about listening to one of the experts say instead of saying, I think you're completely wrong on that. The question was so I can see a little bit further down the road because this is where I serve your dad. Yeah, and on the road, we're going to have this as an obstacle. So we need to think about this decision again up here. And I, I think there's some, there are ways that we can broaden the view a bit and still be really inclusive. I buy completely into your, your word here on let's keep the success of the student at the center. To me, yeah. that's where we, we get, we keep safe if we do that. Right. Well, and it is the, I mean, I love the bouncing back and forth on perspective, right? Where we're like, we're trying to solve this problem. And somebody is like, oh, hold on, hold on. Like, don't create new problems. We do need to solve that problem. But then we have these other things that you need to really be aware of. We have one more thing, Rachel, I think is important right now uh, as we come out of the pandemic. There's urgency for some really difficult conversations ahead. And um, I think I said to you and to Matt a few years ago, um, I, a lot of us have seen change that we're experiencing in the industry and it's, it's, it's happening to us now. And I think there are different domains of our community who are just facing. So I, I ask for kindness from everyone related to the five or four steps of grieving. I can never remember exactly how many there are, but each of us are going through our own sort of reflection on it will not ever go back to the way it was. When we couldn't keep the students from coming in, there were so many. When there was more opportunity for students, when it was less costly, those days are gone. And I have my own approach to that grieving. When you're in a team, there are people who are at different levels of that continuum or stages of that continuum. And I've seen so many ah ahas in a team moment where someone realizes this is gonna change my job. I, I may not have a job as a wow. result of us doing academic advising differently, or if we serve students differently, or if we go from manual processes to the use of technology, what will that mean for me? So a part of building team is, is being empathic, I think, and thinking wow. about that. And as a team leader, thinking about that in advance of the meeting so that you're not caught positioning someone to be put into a place where they see their future and they didn't have a plan that way. And I think we're in some of those moments. For sure. And it can be blindsiding if you are not thinking through from every perspective on your team, what are they going to hear? What are they going to be afraid of? What is the future that then they're forecasting them for themselves? And you, you see on their face that wash over them and you think, I wish I had known that that was coming because I would have done that in a different way or I would have been more careful or whatever. So I think it's great advice to just say, 
in general, um, we will all be impacted, but in various ways. And being thoughtful about that is going to be a place that we create a, a safe team yeah, for sure. Um, okay. I am curious about this. Have you had this experience where you, I'm sure you have, where you walk into a team meeting and you think, oh my goodness, these people do not like each other. Do you have any reflections on, so um, Matt and I have done this several times where we walk into a team meeting and we're like, I don't know if they don't like each other or they don't like us to start. Like we're, but clearly there's some, we're in a group of landmines and we don't know exactly what they are. And we just have to be really careful. And in the course of an hour, so I was thinking about with moving the needle, the advantage that you guys have is that it is a longitudinal We are going to spend time with you. We are going to make incremental changes that are going to help this be a safe team and are going to address those underlying issues. Whereas when I go in and I have an hour and a half with the team and I'm just like, I'm just going to use my best counseling techniques to make sure that nothing blows up. Right. Um, So one thing, Jordan, is do you have any reflections on what that energy in the room is when you walk in and you know, they don't like each other. Like I, it's, it's strange, the subtle things that you can pick up on, mm-hmm. but then also this technique to take what seems to be a mistrustful, unhappy team and move them through to um, success. And, and maybe in addition to that, are there times where you say, this is really broken. We need to disband and come back with different members. Mm -hmm. Or do you feel like we can always recover in those, uh, teams that have some of those underlying issues that we maybe aren't aware of? So, uh, you know, that was a really hard question. I mean, one of the, the challenges for us coming in with moving the needle is pulling people from across the campus who may never have worked before, together before on a problem. And so there can be some landmines, as you call it, in the room. And often we may not know that. So we try to do a lot of homework in advance. Um, We get to know each of the key individuals on the campus pretty intimately. And I mean that uh, with great respect. And we'll ask about your division. We'll ask about your department. And we'll say, so who's not being fully utilized? Who may be pigeonholed in a way? And then as the team itself is being built, we work with the co-chairs of that team and they are trained explicitly about team development and about, can I just say running a good meeting? I mean, one of the ways you get at frustration in a room and landmines in a, in a room is, hey, let's have a fantastic meeting. And this doesn't have to be about you. This could be about the problem and we can do the time really well. And, so I often say first, can we just, can we keep the students at the center? Can we keep the problem going? And, and will that bring some of the, the temperature down in a room? If they learn that we're really going to do something that uses them well and that they can be, that they can be proud of. I, yeah. One of the things I'm noticing is that we're asking people to work on projects without clarity of how this aligns to their work and yes. to our future in the industry. And when I can do that and they can go home and I go, the extra hour I put in today, I'm, imp- I'm moving the needle, right? And so that oftentimes right there will get us a lot more grace and a lot more trust. But we ask the co-chairs in advance, go around the table of people who are going to be in the room and already let's try to build out their alignment of readiness, right? What, what are they going to bring to the table? What yeah. can you navigate in advance? Can you do your coffee or your one-on-one on your lunch? <laughs> and say, look, you're going to be on a team together. I know there's some history politically. I got to tell you, Rachel, I do a lot of work with cabinets. And you want to talk about middle talent teams. We walk into cabinet rooms where there (laughs) is dysfunction. And one of the courageous conversations we have to have in our leadership is we come back into the cabinet. And this is, this is so real. We have just done this recently and say, you know, the entire campus knows the two of you don't get along. You know that, right? So tell us as your partner, how do we, how do we navigate that, right? Wow. Help us navigate that. So keep the problem at the center. If you can go behind the, the scene and do some one-on-one work, what can I do to fix that or to make that better? And, and when necessary and you feel prepared, name it. It's yeah. in the room. We cannot achieve our work unless we name it and deal with it. 
So you just said so many good things. I'm trying to figure out what to, where to start with all of that. So the first one that I want to say is you, I think the idea that we tie your work to a bigger purpose Mm -hmm. is absolutely a way that we unlock conflict. Mm -hmm. So when I feel like all I've done all day is tasks and I'm going home and I'm just annoyed because all I did all day was just, I just checked things off the list and it, there's no, I'm going to have to do it again tomorrow. I'm going to have to do it again tomorrow. Right. Versus saying, Hey, you are doing important work. You are doing good work. We are trying to impact student success and the things that we are doing are going to change the future for your students. I get way more patient. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, Rachel. And there's like this self talk that we do where we say, okay, this is hard right now. We're in the frustration of the work, but we are doing it because it is going to pay off in really meaningful, important, life-changing ways for students that we love, that we're concerned about. So I think that um, it's similar to reminding people about the goal and purpose of your meeting, but it's even broader. Because it's saying, yes, we're trying to accomplish this thing, but then the ripple effect of that out into our community is going to be gigantic. So I love that um, as a a piece. But also, I really like this idea, we have to name the truth of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think you are really gifted at just standing in the middle and saying, we're just going to tell the truth about what's going on here. Because if we don't tell the truth about it, we're never going to be able to move past. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, Jada, about um, how that might look very different depending on your personality and the way that you are in a room. So I think one thing that you and I have in common is I really don't like it when people are being treated badly or when there's something unfair. And so I have, I very strongly will say, Hey, we need to address this. This is not going well. And so let's have some meta communication about that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for some of the people that we work with, that is like that, um, expression of naming the thing, what it is, Mm -hmm. is totally outside of their realm of possibility. Yeah. right? Because they're just, they, they're not representing like that in the room. Mm-hmm. And so I do think it's so important to say there are other ways for you to do that besides the way that you and I might do it, which is you can do it quietly and you can do it individually and you can be very um, thoughtful <laughs> about the way that you express that. It doesn't have to be a come to Jesus meeting like some of us would deliver. Right. <laughs> that's just, well, that's that's just how we are, right? Yeah, there's some good facilitation techniques too. I, I think that uh, I, I would encourage everybody running any kind of meetings of the the sort of what makes a good meeting and we all agree about that. Some of what you talked about at the beginning of can we can we say this is how we want to work, right? Yeah. Even if it's a disappearing workforce group or, or something or a work group, it's like, so what makes a really, I always say, what makes a really good meeting? And the first thing I always ask people, so what's, what's going to make you really want to come to this and say, this was worth my time. And if we can get those two or three things, yeah. inevitably they include everyone is heard. Hmm. So I often will say, hey, I'll take the responsibility for that. You can count on me for that, whether I'm an extrovert or an introvert. And so when I design the meeting, I'm going to design ways that everybody gets heard. So I might do that by saying, take some of my very favorite post-it notes that Rachel mentioned at the beginning. <laughs> And answer, everybody write down the answer to this question, right? And then throw it up on the wall and let's look at it together and do a gallery walk of some sort. Are there ways I can make sure every voice is heard? And boy, does that go a long way with sort of breaking the the moment. Um, And then that allows even a quieter kind of facilitator to say, so we can't leave without hearing from you, Rachel, because we didn't get to hear from you today. So could we hear from you? Right? Yeah. That, that's still inviting. That still goes along with what we all agreed to. So I, I, it's hard to navigate it, right? It is very hard. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, I was thinking also about biggest indicators of a healthy team. Mm. So, you know, when you walk into a team, we had this with your team when we were in North Carolina, we've had this on campuses where we walk in and there's just a spirit of like laughter and good naturedness. Um, 
of respectful disagreement, I'm allowed to say, I don't think that's true, or I have a different opinion and nobody freaks out about it. It's not like I've criticized you. It's that I'm bringing a different perspective. Also thinking about this idea of qualified, strong opinions, which is like, I could be wrong, but I feel very strongly that this thing is true. Right. And so when you see team members talking to each other in that kind of way, what it conveys is, okay, this is a place where we actually can do some work and where everybody is willing to be heard. And we're not going to have to be careful about landmines. I don't know if any other, like you walk into a room and you're like, oh, these people like each other. This is going to be a good team. I don't know if you have any other indicators yeah, of that. I, I think it's usually, uh, and boy, have I missed this during the pandemic, right? We at Crater, we're, we've been saying a lot that it you can you can monitor or manage a relationship uh, in this kind of uh, setting, but it's really hard to start a relationship in this kind of setting. And so, um, when we're on campus, you can tell the the teams that enjoy being with each other. I'd say it's typically sense of humor, the amount of laughter and how early people come. And I don't mean that people don't come late to meetings, but they, they're partnering, they're walking in, they sit with each other. Um, those are all signs that they have some form of relationship. But I, I would just go a little, little bit deeper and say on, on, in terms of my own sense of this is going to be a great team to work with, that there is a, um, there's a shared, we've got this work to do and we're doing it together. So the way, the way people introduce me and introduce themselves. And so I will often, maybe this is a, a tactic that would be helpful to folks. I will ask one person to introduce another um, when we go on campus. So I'll say, Rachel, you introduce Matt, Matt, you introduce Shauna. And, you know, it becomes a little bit of a, an opportunity to say, you know, and, and I love wor working with him, or I, I so appreciate them. So I think there are ways to test the, the partnership between them, their familiarity with each other. Last thing I'll say is uh, I go to small campuses and, and uh, uh, big campuses will say, it's the, the smaller campuses, they must know each other really well. And I, I go to smaller campuses and they're sometimes just as isolated. They, they may know each other by name, but they've not been in strategic collaboration with each other. Yeah. So that's I mean, really different. <laughs> it is so, um, I mean, I, I've been with a team before where they don't know what the other person does. And that's on a small campus. Yes. Like, I'm sorry. I don't really know what you do. You lit your office is literally next to this person and you don't know what they do. Um, to that point, I was thinking one of my favorite things when we're on a campus is we just had this last week where there's a conversation about where, where the people from the campus think we should go eat. So they're telling us like, oh, this is my favorite restaurant. And I was reflecting on how that kind of um, even off topic conversation mm -hmm. is that they haven't had that conversation with each other before. They're not coming in and saying like, it's, this is my favorite restaurant. I love that restaurant. You should go here. Mm -hmm. And so what you see happen to a team, even as you're sharing something ridiculous, like where you should go eat on a campus, it's a different level of connection where we are saying, I see you as a person. I understand something different about you now. I would never have guessed that that's a thing that you love. And so in that, uh, in the book, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, he talks about just have somebody say like, what's your hometown? Because this is something that you wouldn't know otherwise. And you can learn so much about a person. What do you have siblings? Where are you in your sibling? Those kinds of conversations. I think when we lead them as facilitators, we learn a lot about the comfortableness with the team. And also it's an opportunity for us to create these rich personal connections that then fuel our work towards the vision of student success and really whatever our goal is. So I it's love that. A bucket of trust, right? I'm always thinking about how do I, how do I put trust in the bank? And, and how, do, how do people feel seen in the work? I, I think that's really important. Uh, I, last thing on this topic for me is that um, at the structural level for moving the needle, we're pretty adamant that every team that's working together on a strategic student success initiative, um, we, sometimes, we call that a module. When they're doing that work together, we always have it populated by half faculty and half staff, no matter what the, the goal is. So it can be something that, that is actually gonna change the, 
the business of being a student or it can be something that's going to change the curriculum, right? That, that we know faculty own that, but we still co-staff it the way I talk about it. And what's so fascinating about that is that when they learn what the other does, there is so much power in thinking about us as a team and in how what I do does impact you and how we are in this together. And I, I think that problem solving in combination is actually the greatest secret sauce you can have uh, in work on campuses. So I know divisions or areas or departments want to meet, meet together and go away for their retreat in the summer and go, yeah, let's go solve <laughs> one problem that we've had. And I always say, bring two coaches with you, one person from facilities, somebody over here and put the problem in the middle of the table and find out what happens to your culture when you do yeah. that. It's so good because it's it's very easy to know, to know what the other is thinking. We know about faculty. We know how they think about students. We know about student development, we, right? Yeah. But then when it's not the other, it's John who's sitting in front of me, who's expressing a real opinion about how he cares about students and what's important in the work he does. Yeah. It totally changes the way that we think about other yeah. and brings them in to say us. It's just us, right? So Jaretta, you've given us a lot of really great action items as we go through. I know Trey is going to have a lot of fun kind of... Um, going through and, and grabbing clips of all of the things that you've said. I'm thinking about how do we pay attention in our teams to vulnerability, to how we manage conflict, to how we deliver um, our goals and, and create this cohesive press forward to what's most important and at the same time tie it to this bigger vision. Um, I was thinking about how you often and team meetings by saying, hey, tell, let's all tell this person what we appreciate about them. Um, and Matt and I has, have also talked about as a leader saying to our team, tell me what I can do differently. Tell, tell me what I didn't do so well in this meeting or what you need from me. Mm -hmm. um, and just inviting that kind of transparency and vulnerability, I think is a way for us to really move towards this great team culture, which you guys in moving the needle, I mean, everything that you're doing is building this culture and this team that is going to increase our student success. And I'm thinking about the advantage a campus has when we say for five years, we are going to schedule time to hold space, to listen to each other, to define what success looks like, to push towards a goal that we've decided is really important. And what I have seen with so many moving the needle clients is that it results in real changes, policy changes, procedures change, our posture towards our students change. And as a practitioner, what I love about that is then the outcome is an increase in retention. I wasn't focused on the increase in retention. I was focused on the student and making sure we're doing the right thing for them. And then what do you know? The, move on, the, the needle moves. I'm thinking about campuses you've worked with where you get it all together and it's a 12% increase in retention because they had time and space to get it right. So I love that so much. Um, you guys are such a bright spot in higher education for student-centered processes um, and focus so that we can impact a million students um, over the coming years. So thank you so much, friend, for joining me. I know everybody is enlightened, um, and I am eager to continue our work and to leverage all of your expertise so that we can impact many, many students over the following years. Well, it's really apparent why we are such good partners, because our hearts are about the students and about the people who serve them and about change. So the only thing I would add to your beautiful uh, review of the work that we have done on campuses is we, we are making change on campus. And that just in and of itself is difficult, right? It's just hard to do. And so if we can do that together instead of having it done to us, that's yeah. like the way people will feel like they are empowered for a long time. So thanks so much for having me today. Yeah, it was such a joy. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you next week.